Um, thank you for allowing me to present today. Um, <clears throat> I was originally going to uh, present with Elia from uh, Datalinks. However, Elia has some, some challenges with uh, water ingress uh, at, at his premises uh, today, so he's unable to join us. So he, he sends his apologies. Uh, so <clears throat> just to give you a very quick background, uh, uh, Elia and I have collaborated with a lot of uh, academic and commercial research organizations to maximize the value of data. Uh, <clears throat> for me personally, uh, I've been at NetApp for four years now, and I work with most of the, the major academic institutions that, that are around Australia and uh, over in New Zealand as well. I presented at uh, eResearch Australasia and eResearch New Zealand recently, and I continue my work uh, both on a commercial basis as well as volunteering to participate in community activities uh, to help enhance uh, the value of research uh, for all Australians. Uh, one of my focal areas that I'm working on at the moment is Indigenous research. And um, <clears throat> that's a very interesting area because um, it crosses over a number of um, quantitative and qualitative areas and domains of interest. So um, uh, I'm currently active in working in a few of those at the moment. Uh, there are some that are commercially sensitive, so I can't mention what they actually are. Okay, so uh, today's topic is around data quality assessment, but uh, before we dive into that, um, <clears throat> the, I would like to frame um, what data quality assessment belongs to and as, as part, of, it's part of data quality management. So <clears throat> the whole um, uh, data quality management domain um, the, the, uh, talks about making data fit for consumption and meeting the needs of data consumers. And it's subjective because the quality of data relates to how it's going to be used and who's going to use it and what, um, <clears throat> what the outcomes uh, we're trying to drive from the data is. So in today's presentation, I'll go through uh, a few examples of where, the, the, um, where data quality assessment is essential for driving academic and commercial outcomes. All right. Um, Okay, so we need to assess the quality of data because not doing so can lead to some, some big issues, right? So um, in these three examples, uh, which I'll go through quickly, there are elements of both commercial and academic challenges that are caused by uh, a lack of um, the ability to assess the quality of data. So a <clears throat> Spanish submarine project, uh, a misplaced decimal point uh, led to submarines uh, being 70 tons heavier than and plan now. That's a um, <clears throat> that that's an issue from a cost perspective, but also for the people operating the submarine. If they can't resurface the submarine and they're going to drop to the bottom of the sea, uh, that's going to be a, a real problem socially as well as for the lives of those people. Um, another example is in the Air Canada um, incident. Um, they had an error in the calculation of how much fuel to put in the plane, and and the, as a as a result, the plane crashed landed. All right. Um, and the third one was um, uh, <clears throat> Enron being an energy company that did a lot of R&D. Um, one of the challenges they had was uh, errors in their spreadsheets. Uh, and when they did an audit, um, almost a quarter of their spreadsheets contained serious errors. So I'm pretty sure that a lot of us use tools like R, Python, or Excel uh, to analyze data or maybe Power BI even uh, these days. And uh, all of those tool sets, if you feed uh, data of insufficient quality into them uh, may result in anomalous results that can have negative impacts. So <clears throat> all around the research data lifecycle, um, the data goes through several uh, steps in the process. So uh, <clears throat> the first one is creation at top there, which is where data gets ingested or created by a model for example, and then around the life cycle, there's processing analysis, preservation, um, and, and access and reuse. And um, I'm sure that, uh, you know, if we have time afterwards, we can dig a bit more into each of the steps in the process, but at each step, errors can creep into data and metadata. So one of the, the key areas we see, um, well, areas of challenge uh, around data errors, um, uh, sensor data errors. So sensors can 
go uh, can can be inaccurate. Um, they, things like um, sensors can get wet, for example, um, and that can affect the electronics in the sensor or the orientation of the sensor might not be correct. Um, <clears throat> there could be a data stream coming from a sensor, for example, um, where um, uh, there might be a, an interruption in the stream and we don't know what caused an interruption. So there um, could be um, anomalies um, in the, uh, so there's anomalies maybe caused by a loss of um, data in the stream or an error in transmission, and we won't, might not know what they are. All right. um, there could be issues with codes or APIs. For example, in the work that we do, we often have to pass data between um, different APIs, and sometimes the data format um, can be corrupted in between, or perhaps the field is truncated. Uh, back in the days of mainframes, we saw uh, screen scraping applications have problems with uh, pulling data out of those sorts of environments because the fields got moved on the screen and the screen scraping application was still trying to scrape the same characters on the screen. And as a result, the, the data moved over and, and was read incorrectly. Uh, we can get false positives and aliasing, and I'll be looking at an example of that a little bit further in the presentation. Human error is always an issue. Somebody um, copying and pasting data from the wrong folder to the wrong folder. Um, and of course, um, a poor or missing data architecture can result in systemic data quality failures. So how do we assess what those failures are? How do we quantify? Well, um, this organization precisely uh, offers um, several different metrics that can be used to quantify uh, these errors at a very basic level. So, um, <clears throat> You know, how many errors do we have relative to the size of the data? Uh, number of empty values, um, <clears throat> error rates when data is transformed. So uh, when, when say uh, data is composed together, how many blanks, blanks do we find in the data when there should be data there, for example? Um, <clears throat> how much unusable data is there? For example, anomalous results from sensors that are say out of range. So we're looking at a sensor that should return the value between zero and 100. If it's um, providing numbers like uh, 10,000 or a million, we know it's out of range, right? Uh, but is that actually the correct data or is it just the sensor playing up, right? Um, in a more commercial environment where people are looking at email responses, um, email bounce rates, for example, the last two I would challenge, are they actually data quality issues? Right, so data storage costs, not really a quality issue, right? It's more of a cost issue, uh, but poor data quality can lead to more runs having to be made to resolve those issues, which can result in higher storage costs. Um, and also um, the amount of time it takes to get to an answer. Um, that's not really a quality issue either, but bad quality data can impact the time it takes to get to those uh, outcomes. So here is an example of um, how data quality impacts my personal work at NetApp. This is a, a real live example. I've obviously cut out the, the customer identities around the edges, but what you can see there is that we ingest data from our tool sets um, that analyze data on remote endpoints. So we collect data like uh, thermal data and physical operational data from systems, as well as um, data as well as data around performance and, um, and the presence of data assets. Uh, and so we collect all of the data from the field and we aggregate and average it. Now, sometimes we find holes in the data and I'll, I'll go into that in a little bit. Um, in the top right, you'll see that uh, we analyze and preserve the data. So we do this initial um, pre-processing and then we save the data sets after we check them, check them. And in the third step, we re-access that data to be able to uh, create solutions. And we require high accuracy to size those solutions correctly for our clients. In the same way, in an academic environment, um, the quality of the data would allow a scientist to produce results and publish a paper um, that, uh, where the data can be relied on if the data is of sufficient quality. Now, here's an example from a real world R&D client that I worked with recently. Uh, you can see the three pie charts there. Um, they, they asked us to do some detailed performance analysis, um, but we encountered some technologies that had legacy code in them and wouldn't return 
um, some data. It didn't return all the data. So you can see that first graph, there's a 3% um, uh, rate on the amount of data that didn't have any performance uh, data associated with it. And the second one, a 1%. So those two were considered to be of sufficient quality to drive the outcomes we're looking for. The third one is the standout. 93% um, of the data that came back didn't have performance data. So that was a problem. We, we noted that straight away, went back to the client and said, um, in order to solve the problem, what we'd like to do is we would like to take the performance profiles from tables type A and B and use them as a projection to even like fill out the rest of um, type C as, a, as an extrapolation. So we did some algorithms to do that. Uh, we went through the process with the client and they were quite happy with the outcomes. Um, and as a result, they were confident to invest further in, in, the, in the required IT platform to, to support their future R&D projects. In our next example, this is for a very large research organization in Australia. Um, they, <laughs> excuse me, they do voyages that collect data um, and they asked us to help them uh, create a data pipeline that could be automated but uh, would also do automatic quality checks along the pipeline. So at each stage, one, two, three, and four, uh, the platform has built-in checks that, uh, that, that would store the results of those quality checks back in the data hub. So what that means is that as the data moves through the pipeline, all of the, all of the quality checks are being stored and can be viewed in the data quality dashboard. That's a work in progress at the moment. And what that means is that data scientists will be able to look at the relative quality based on the criteria of data as it moves through that pipeline um, and associate it with the tags uh, for the data as well. So that means that, that they will be able to know whether it's a, an original copy of the data or a derivative copy and assess the quality against the quality benchmarks. <clears throat> This example is from a, a commercial banking client. And what we found is that as we're measuring data in the environment, um, something changed there on the 4th of March, as you can see. Uh, so taking the average and peak readings over that whole time period can mask those nuances that reveal those insights. So understanding and looking at the time series data is important as well. And we also found that um, there was one spike in performance, as you can see in that bottom graph, um, and that was a, a demand spike. It only happened once in the whole month. So when we, when we were looking at how we designed the solution using this data, uh, we looked at those two dotted lines. So the top one is what is the absolute peak in the sampling period? We designed for that, we're likely to overserve and waste money. And if you look at the bottom line, which is the average, if we designed just for the average, we, we're likely to underserve and cause attrition through dissatisfaction because things take too long, transactions don't complete, et cetera. So, so ideally we want to design for about what that midline looks like. So um, the, the, um, uh, the highest frequency of peaks and look at what that peak reading is, which is around about the 20 mark. So that's what we chose to design to and the customer was happy with that. So this is, these are some of the, the challenges we, we face with <clears throat> um, commercial data quality, but it also applies to research data where perhaps the research is tied to a commercial outcome. Um, we've been talking to some scientists about the increasing uh, pressure to commercialize their research and uh, being able to look at time series data and analyze the quality of data over time and zoom in on those, those anomalous spikes that might impact quality of the outcomes uh, is becoming more and more important. And the fourth example, from a more strategic level, we're working with a commercial research organization spun off from a university. Uh, so one of the, some of the challenges they face are around the velocity, accuracy, and cost effectiveness of the instrument survey results they're doing. So they're working with very large data sets. There could be hundreds of terabytes in each data set, um, and they need to quickly assess the quality of that data. So we're currently working with them to create a framework in which they can <clears throat> quickly determine uh, what the appropriate level of quality is. 
So what is common in all of these examples is that there is a, a certain tool set that we use um, in, in, our, uh, in our work. So I just wanted to share um, a, a typical example of what we do. So in order to assess the quality of data, this is for both commercial and ac academic environments, uh, we collect data from the environment uh, using a couple of different sets of tools. So on the bottom right, you see we collect data from uh, our data infrastructure. And at the top right, uh, we collect data from scientific research. Uh, the data hub on the left then aggregates the data together and does feature extraction. So it looks at what, what does the master data model look like? What are the quality features we're looking for? It can do versioning, tagging, correlation, anomaly management. It can do data federation and migration. Uh, so what it delivers is the ability to make data quality discoverable, observable, and actionable. So using the data hub, if a quality problem is detected, uh, it allows us to go back to the data scientists to have that conversation early around um, whether we need to find out where that data problem is coming from and how to solve those problems. So underpinning that is the architecture, which we call the data fabric. The data fabric is uh, a design concept that allows research organizations to create, sorry, to create the right environment to manage data quality efficiently. Uh, sometimes what we found is that um, uh, looking at data quality, the cost of managing data quality if it's done incorrectly uh, or suboptimally actually exceeds the benefit it provides. And sometimes that is challenging because although we can come up with good ideas around what data quality should look like, the commercial reality is somebody has got to pay for the tools and the components to observe, to observe measure and uh, enforce data quality. And that, that is sometimes where things fall over. So uh, often we hear uh, sentiments like great idea, but it looks too costly and expensive to implement. The data fabric is a way of breaking that down into its constituent components. So each of those, those components can be looked at um, and in an incremental fashion so that those sorts of data quality um, uh, benefits can be delivered uh, without having to uh, boil the ocean, so to speak. So in conclusion, uh, we, when we look at data quality, uh, data's got to be fit for consumption to meet the user needs. Uh, quality issues can arise anywhere in the data life cycle. Uh, they impact both academic and commercial research. Um, the, the, the outcomes can be devastating or differentiating. So good quality data um, that's managed efficiently can result in great differentiation in terms of being able to publish a research paper that's, that's uh, reliable or a commercial outcome that differentiates commercial success, or it can be devastating. If the data quality isn't right, um, it can impact people's lives in a significant way and sometimes in a permanent way. Um, so the best practice is early detection and correction. Right? And that can only be done with the right data architecture and the right tools to ensure it's sustainable. So, uh, any questions?